married on the city of Canterbury 10 land girls out of a group of 11 who were all billeted on the opposite side of the city from the farm on which they were working, turned up next day on time. The youngest, the 11th, had not been seen since the night before. She turned up some two and a half hours later looking decidedly pale and pulling bits of plaster dust from her hair, she told the farmer that she'd had to be dug out of the rubble that morning and would he mind not reporting her to county headquarters for being late. Another one of the girls um, whose special charge on the, on the farms was to look after the dairy cows was worried about how they would cope with the noise and the confusion and flames of the air raid. So she cycled through the burning city, through the blackout, just to be with her animals in their stalls and comfort them. She was subsequently awarded the county badge for courage and interviewed by the local press and told the reporter the milk was wanted, the cows needed looking after, and that's all there was to it, so bugger Hitler. <laughs> a lady called Evelyn Webster, who I spoke to on many occasions, joined the land army at 17, and she told me, I chose dairy farming because I wanted to work with animals, but I was so green, I had no idea that a bull was different to a cow. One day I was told to take feed and water into him, and being only five foot six, he seemed to be at me seemed to me about 10 foot high, but I walked in gaily with my buckets. First he knocked me off my feet with a kick of his, a toss of his head, then he gave a great kick and practically kicked me from the stall. But there were compensations. One of the cows was very temperamental, and I was the only person on the farm who could milk her because all the men were frightened of her. Johnny Brown has gone to sea and left his hallowed farm to me. So clad in manly boots and breeks, we toil among the beans and leeks, casting flowers from their bed and putting onions in instead. When the war was finally over, nearly a quarter of a million women and girls had seen their own version of active service on the fields of England. In the Stand Down Parade in September 1950, the young Princess Elizabeth said, the story of the Land Army has been one of great response by the women of our country to the call of duty in our nation's hour of greatest danger and need. By their efforts, they helped ensure that our fields contributed their utmost towards our food supplies, and for this the nation owes them an everlasting debt. That everlasting debt was a very long time in being officially recognised. It wasn't until the late 1980s that surviving members of the Land Army were invited to join the Remembrance Day Parade in Whitehall. And it was a good four or five years later that the Land Girl Medal was struck by DEFRA and offered to those who gave their service willingly. Um, although we had something like two and a quarter million extra acres of farmland producing food, and the willing hands of the land army to look after them, there was still a major problem. The government decided that something had to be done, and what was needed to be done was to conscript all the hundreds of thousands of acres of this country still producing no food at all. And those acres were, of course, to be found in every town, every village, and every city in the country, the front and back gardens of England. Um, the RHS and the government teamed up to produce an advertising campaign early in 1939, encouraging people to make the best of food grown it themselves. They launched the campaign under the title The National Grow More Food Campaign, which from the title, as you might suspect, was a complete and utter flop because not only is it a dreary title, it was a very confusing one because there was, at the time, and I believe this, there is a variety of chemical fertiliser called National Grow More. So people thought it was an advertising campaign. So it was relaunched the following spring and called More Food From Your Garden, which is just as dreary as the first title, really. So the government did what governments always do when they run out of ideas and they're in a tough spot. They actually stole an idea from somebody else and called it their own. And they stole an idea from the gardening correspondent of the London Evening Standard, who'd used a particular expression as a column header late in 1939, and that, of course, was Dig for Victory. The Dig for Victory campaign, as it became called, was an immediate success. 
because you are left in no doubt whatsoever what the campaign is asking you to do. Um, it is telling you what you need to do and why you need to do it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and when the, um, the government agencies got involved and teamed up the headline with the famous boot on the spade, did for victory went wild. There is, however, something majorly wrong with the image that the government used. Now, granted that that is a man, obviously, uh, um, a leg obviously belonged to a man when it could possibly have been better done by a woman, but that, of course, is his left leg. And one asks, where is his right leg? because it should be on the other side of the spade. Now, I know if you are right-handed, you do tend to push the blade of the spade into the ground with your left foot for balance. Um, but I, the more I looked at it, the more I thought there was something odd. Um, so I did some digging around, if you pop the plant, in the archives of the Imperial War Museum um, in Lambeth, and found a, a small note from a government minister um, in around 1938 to 1939, admitting that the dig for victory boot is not actually attached to a real leg. It is attached to the leg of a shop window dummy, which was dismantled and dressed up and held in front of the camera, obviously by somebody with no great gardening technique experience. Because unless one is a member of the Royal Ballet and does one's gardening like that, it's not actually physically possible for that leg to be um, attached to a real person. Then later in the year the commercial artists got involved and the ante was upped slightly. The poster on the left hand side, Grow Your Own Food, makes very clear and very explicit the link between your garden fork and your knife and fork. Um, and the image on the right hand side is very clever because the blade and shaft of the spade has been turned into the bows and the funnel of a ship, bringing armaments, bringing troops, bringing machinery, rather than having to bring potatoes and wheat for food. Um, the Dig for Victory poster is still actually informing um, current design. This is a poster from the Break New Ground campaign run by the Australian government in the late 1980s. Um, very similar to Dig for Victory, um, increasing urban output of food. Um, and you can see that it has influenced, um, have been influenced by the original design, granted that it is still the left leg. Um, but it's actually been drawn from an angle where it actually becomes physically possible for it to be attached to a human. Um, and it would also appear to be the leg of a lady. Um, the Dig for Victory campaign was not just one poster. It was a whole raft of advertising and propaganda materials. It was discovered in late 1939, early 1940, that most amateur gardeners had no idea about how to keep their garden or their allotment turning food out all year round. Um, so a series of leaflets were issued by the government and the RHS which covered every single possible aspect of home food production. Um, there were booklets about how to um, make a compost heap, that kind of thing. Um, my favourite leaflet, um, which unfortunately um, is still under copyright, so I wasn't able to find an image, covers home wine production. And it does rather read like an episode of The Good Life, you know, people, burgundy, nettle wine, that kind of thing. On the back, in relatively small print compared to the rest of the text, is an admission, a highly acceptable wine that may also be produced from grapes. <laughs> Who knew? Um, the RHS undertook to provide a qualified horticultural speaker for any group of sufficient size, which could be gathered in relative safety in a place away from the threat of bombing. Um, this was taken up enthusiastically and an RHS advice bureau was set up in um, village halls and school assembly rooms up and down the land. The RHS had to withdraw from that 
um, idea within about six months of it starting because they found out that most of these advice sessions were taking place in the relative safety of the local pub. And they decided that they couldn't possibly be teaching people about how to grow their own food, where they were also people enjoying themselves. The RHS has not changed in 75 years. Um, of course, these were the days before television services began. Every household in the country had its wireless set in the corner of the living room. The BBC made appropriate use of this by offering encouragement to amateur gardeners by broadcasting information over the airwaves. They started their campaign in early 1940 by offering a play appropriately called to Dig for Victory, which is told in rhyming verse, rather like a pantomime, and concerns Mr. Christopher Crick, who is an enthusiastic gardener of roses and decorative plants, but knows nothing about vegetables. But he listens to the wireless and goes along to the advice sessions and becomes interested in growing his own food. And by the end of the war has become such an expert on the topic that he is asked to join the committee of his local horticultural society. The play ends with the line, there's an obvious moral with Christopher Craig. If he can grow turnips, he also can dig. So back to the land, if you are able, contribute a carrot to our national table. The hero of the airwaves um, was the gardening instructor and the two gentlemen in the, um, in the middle, Winford Thomas and Roman Glendinning, who were employed by the BBC, decided to adopt a derelict allotment not that far from the Listen Grove Broadcasting Studios in North West London. Listeners were treated to a live broadcast once a week as the allotment was saved from dereliction and brambles and brought back into full and constructive use. Um, but the voice of the airwaves as far as gardening was concerned throughout the war and well into the 60s was undoubtedly this chap, Mr Middleton. Um, Mr Cecil Middleton, to give him his full name, started his BBC career in 1934 with a talk which was broadcast every Sunday afternoon called In Your Garden. And it was broadcast at half past two on a Sunday afternoon. The BBC was very proud that some four and a half million people tuned in every Sunday afternoon to listen to Mr Middleton. Now, if you're familiar with his broadcast, he did um, become a television gardener by the end of his career. Mr Middleton, listening to Mr Middleton is a little bit of an uphill struggle sometimes. He had a very strange, unlocalised kind of Midlands accent, and his voice didn't modulate at all. It didn't rise and fall during normal speech. It was all very, very flat. So listening to Mr Middleton can be, as I said, a bit of an uphill struggle. And bear in mind that it was broadcast, as I said, at half past two, three o'clock on Sunday afternoon. You have done your nine to five, Monday to Friday office job. And at that time in our history, you probably did nine o'clock till half past 12 on Saturday morning as well. You've done your voluntary work, you've done a bit of ARP warning work, you've lost a couple of nights sleep through air raids and general confusion. You've spent Saturday afternoon digging for victory on your allotment, probably Sunday morning as well. Um, Sunday lunch is the biggest and the heaviest meal you're going to get all week. So you have your Sunday lunch, come into the front room, sit down in a nice comfy chair, throw another um, log onto the fire, turn on the radio and listen to the beginning of In Your Garden with Mr Middleton. I would imagine that by half past three, the vast majority of those listeners will probably fast asleep and snoring in their armchair. With her husband gone to war, these East End kids have come to stay. Refugees, she'd done her best to spark some sort of interest. But city children, they'd run wild. The youngest, sewn into his vest, had coughed all night and cried for his mum. The girl had nits. The eldest one, this boy, had taken to it though. She took him out a cup of tea. We'll make a garden of him yet, you'll see. That autumn 1943, she'd got the spuds and carrots clamped. A layer of straw, a layer of spuds, a layer of straw, a layer of spuds, <coughs> and covered over with the earth for frost protection later on. And Sonny, he was shaping up to be a country boy by now. Hard to believe six months before, he'd never even seen a cow, 
Now here he was, her right-hand man, at sorting the beans and wintering down. The docks, the elder and the twitch, which didn't know the war was on, came up relentless as before. Unpatriotic, said the weeds. War? What war? And Sammy, a young East End boy, was sent out with a trenching spade to cut the roots and hoik them out. In all this time, quietness reigned. They'd never told her the war was quiet. But evenings in the Sussex sky, while gazing out towards the downs, were only birds and wood smoke. No distant bombers droning, just the sound of Sammy sawing wood. And had it not all been so tragic, then it might have been quite good. Vita sat the west who gardened down at Sissinghurst Castle, wrote a regular gardening advice column during the war for the Observer magazine. She covered many aspects of gardening, and in 1942 she wrote a small piece which was called Dig for Beauty. And Dig for Beauty was quite contentious at the time. It aroused comment, and Vita was accused in the press of being unpatriotic. Dig for Beauty surmises that it was as important to continue growing beautiful plants and flowers in our gardens, to nourish the spirit and the soul, just as important, if not more so, as growing potatoes and cabbages to nourish the body. Dig for Beauty essentially is about hope, and hope is something that all gardeners must have. If you are not an optimistic person, then you might just as well take up knitting. Um, and hope must have been in very short supply during those dark days. The end of the article reads, a hospital in a small south coast town ran out of its sand supply for its sandbags. It therefore authorised its willing helpers to obtain sand or soil from wherever it was necessary. Even, in the, even, in from, even from the public gardens, if need be. Sacks were filled and stacked up, and no questions were asked. They stood there, sturdily and sodden, protecting the walls and the windows of the hospital through the winter. But with the spring came a sudden change. Green shoots began to appear through splits in the sacking. And now the whole grim barricade blows with the golden hope of daffodils. Those who have the will to win cook potatoes in their skin, knowing that the sight of peelings deeply hurts Lord Walton's feelings. Lord Walton, being the Minister of Food during the war, um, described himself as being in charge of the biggest grocer's shop that the country had ever seen. One of the ways in which the war made itself immediately apparent to the average housewife was the sudden disappearance of the humble onion from the greengrocer's shop, mainly because we had been relying on places like the Channel Islands, northern France, for the majority of our onion supply. And of course, once the U-boats started patrolling, those supply lines were cut. In February 1941, so scarce were onions that a pound and a half of them were raffled between the staff of the London Times and raised the grand sum of four pounds, three shillings and threepence. At a first aid demonstration in Chelsea, there was absolute <coughs> chaos when the demonstrator mentioned that the best way to peel onions and avoid your eyes from running was to peel the onions wearing your gas mask. There was a shout from the back of the hall which threw all into confusion. Yes, madam, but where did you get your bloody onion from? A Cheshire GP wrote to his local paper and told the story of the best gift I ever received from a grateful patient, a large Spanish onion. My wife thought me a splendid fellow for at least a week afterwards. And the announcer on the BBC Children's Hour reading out birthday announcements told, I did hear a story of a lucky little girl the other day who was given a beautifully wrapped onion for her birthday, but we can't all expect lovely presents like that, boys and girls. Carrots were in short supply, seemingly everybody grew them, but nobody knew what to do with them except chop them and boil them. People were um, encouraged to write in to their favourite radio programmes and their favourite um, magazines, giving suggestions as to how the, the national glut of carrots might be used up. 
chap called Derek Lambert wrote to me, one morning a jar was put onto the breakfast table with supreme nonchalance. Only those accustomed to the prelude of one of my mother's wartime culinary offerings would have been familiar with the symptomatic exaggerated indifference to our reactions. My father, a normally undemonstrative man, spread some of the contents of the jar onto his bread and bit into it. He frowned and asked what it was. Carrot marmalade, dear, said my mother. With unusual deliberation, my father picked up the jar, took it into the garden and poured the contents onto the compost heap. Because of the shortage of paper and also the shortage of print workers, such gardening books as were published during the war were in very limited numbers, of low print quality and of paper that could only be described as horrendous. One of the very few books surviving from the period I found on the shelves of the RHS Museum in um, Victoria, The Garden Goes to War, the cover of which shows the entire family um, mucking in and digging up a fairly substantial back lawn by the looks of it in order to dig for victory. It is essentially an idiot's guide to growing your own food, written by a man with much experience. The introduction says, we shall have to grow vegetables. It is no use thinking we can continue during the war, giving so much work and thought just to keep trim lawns and fine flowers. It is sad to look, look back upon the good work that has to be undone, but after all, it is a small sacrifice. Let us hope that one day we can soon restore what must now be destroyed. I refuse to touch the rose beds until every other corner of the garden has been planted with vegetables and I do not promise to do anything to the rose beds even then. I have done a lot of silly things with vegetables, and yet they all still survived, and there is no mystery about growing one's food that need worry anybody. In fact, the morale value of flowers was eventually recognised by the government, who decreed that where you had both a front and back garden, only the back garden should be used for digging for victory. This rationalised the space because for most of us our back garden is significantly bigger than our front. But there was always the security aspect. We have this idea of the war being a golden period during which everybody helped everybody else. But there were always during the war people who found that fruit and vegetables tasted significantly better if somebody else had gone to the pleasure of growing them for you. And then Enter onto the scene the Anderson Shelter. Some three and a half million were erected in back gardens up and down the country, free of charge for any householder earning less than £250 a year. Um, some 27% of the population availed themselves of the offer. But of the offer. Um, named after the Home Secretary, Dr John Anderson, and designed by another Anderson, Dr David Anderson. They were four and a half feet wide, six feet high, and six and a half feet long, and had to be erected in a trench, which was at least one foot deeper and one foot larger than the structure itself. It would then have to be covered over with the earth that you'd removed in order to give it some stability against back blast. Um, they were, however, because they were partly underground, cold, dark and damp. And many Anderson shelters survived in back gardens well into the 60s and 70s. I remember my grandma in Lincolnshire um, had hers to keep the bicycles in. Um, I remember she told me the story of the day when the Anderson shelter arrived. My poor grandpa Ernest spent a long, hot afternoon digging the trench putting the Anderson shelter up in it and covering it over with all the earth, called her out into the garden from the kitchen from doing the washing up, and he said, now it's time to test the Anderson shelter. So in they both went, and then they both sat looking at each other for about 30 seconds, and my grandma didn't like it, and she came out and she stood on the cinder path with her arms folded and the two towels still over her shoulder, and she said, Ernest, if a bomb comes over and it's got my name on it, I would rather go to meet my God from the bed that we've shared every night since the day when we were wed. I'm not going to be buried alive down at the end of the garden in that dirt, dark, dirty little hole. 
Because if that happens, it means that Hitler will have got one over on me, and I ain't having that. So she never went into the Anderson shelter again. My grandfather made much use of it and went into it regularly, growing mushrooms in the cold and the dark with which he supplied the entire street. Baxter Land, today at 1.15, brings you more expert advice on how to turn that backyard over to the best account, said the Radio Times in 1942. And this chap has obviously been listening because there are bees and chickens and pigs and bunnies and a cow and just off the top of the screen also a goat. Um, the trouble was people found that because they didn't know how to feed their pets during the war, many hundreds of thousands of dogs and cats had actually been destroyed by their owners. So the children of this country were slightly bereft. When domestic livestock made an appearance in people's gardens, it often spelt disaster because they got attached to the chicken or the rabbit. They fed it regularly, they gave it a name, and when something acquires a name, it becomes a pet and becomes part of the family. Even parents found it difficult after looking after a hutch full of rabbits for six or nine months, found it quite difficult to go out and wring the neck of something brown and fluffy which just sat there looking up at you with big brown expectant eyes. This was a problem encountered by Enid Blyton, the famous children's writer, who was pestered unmercifully by her two young daughters to keep some rabbits in their garden in Beaconsfield. She said, they are not to be given names, they are not pets, they are for us to eat. But she was gradually worn down and eventually sighed and said, okay, the two rabbits will get names, but I will choose the names. And that is why Enid Brighton's rabbits were called Sunday Lunch and Rabbit Stew. <laughs> Children played a, a valuable part in gardening during the war, certainly on the Isle of Wight. Um, because of the growing conditions, it was um, decreed by the government that new potato crop should be sourced almost exclusively, if possible, from the Isle of Wight because the supply from the Channel Islands was cut off to us. Um, a detachment of the Luftwaffe found out that the Isle of Wight was now our supply of new potatoes and decided to, to um, ruin it by dropping boxes of Colorado beetles onto the crop. Children were sent out in the fields to find the beetles. German efficiency helped it play a part in its own downfall because the boxes of Colorado beetles were always of two standard sizes. The smaller of the two always contained 50 beetles, and the larger size contained 100. You can imagine some poor German woman doing her war work by counting Colorado beetles into boxes. If the um, plane was spotted buzzing the potato fields on the Isle of Wight, once the all-clear had sounded, lessons were interrupted for the day. The children were sent out into the potato fields to find the box. And when they had established what size the box was, they knew how many Colorado beetles they were looking for. If they found the larger box, lessons were not resumed until 100 beetles had been counted back into it. If you didn't have a garden, you found yourself in an allotment. Allotment hearing became a national craze and they were squeezed in, literally wherever space could be found. On the left-hand side, Chap is hoeing his onions under the watchful eye of Prince Albert in Kensington Palace Gardens. At the top right is the onion crop from 1944. One of the um, um, curators at Kew Gardens found that he had not also um, developed a passion and a talent for nurturing orchids, but a hitherto undiscovered passion and talent for growing onions. And this is his crop laid out in front of the, um, the orangery. At the bottom on the right hand side, does anybody care to hazard a guess as to where this might be? It is Tower Hill, yes, in the background you can just see the arches of Tower Bridge. This is the dry motor Tower of London. Um, which was donated to the Beefy 
this by the London County Council, and they were asked to cultivate allotments in the moat um, during their spare time. As well as being valuable for the scrap effort, it was considered that railings in public parks were dangerous because they would inhibit public progress across the park in times of panic. If people were running across the park in order to find a place of safety, if they had to follow the paths, then they might not make it, so the railings were removed. There was a propaganda value as well um, for scrap metal. In fact, it was said that the railings around your house can go off and fight, digging for victories and maybe passive resistance. Um, but most people discovered that the quality of their railings was so poor that they never got any further towards being um, a spitfire than a huge rusting pile of scrap metal at the local county council <laughs> depot. Just to round off, just a point, the plight of the commercial market gardener who was subject to what were called cropping orders. Um, a series of stringent policies laid down by the government as to what you could grow, where, and under what conditions. This is a painting called The Greenhouse in um, Tate Britain. Um, the cropping order on asparagus was particularly harsh because it was forbidden. Asparagus takes up the ground for three or four years before it starts giving a worthwhile crop, so it was banned during the war. The cropping order on tomatoes stated that where you had a hated glass house, you had to turn it over at least 90% of the space to, to tomatoes for at least two thirds of the year. Most of our tomato crop had been coming from places like the Canary Islands. But again, those sources were cut off. This market gardener has been very crafty. He has cordoned the tomatoes by removing the lateral shoots up and over the inside of the, the, um, the glass roof so they get the vast majority of heat and light coming through. Leaving the staging completely clear for what would otherwise be forbidden decorative pot plants. Um, um, but keeping to the letter of the law rather than to the spirit of it, um, I think was the, the most appropriate thing in this case. By 1943, we were beginning to run short of seeds. The United States Allotment Society is clubbed together and sent nearly 90 tonnes of vegetable seeds in small brown paper envelopes um, to this country where they were distributed by the Women's Institute, the Women's Royal Voluntary Service. There was, however, an unexpected but entirely legitimate way of getting hold of fruit tomato plants. The tomato seed is a very strong and robust thing. And it can pass through the human digestive tract completely unharmed. It can also cope with all the processes meted out to it at the local sewage treatment company. Because of the lack of chemical fertilizers, um, people looked around for a replacement and decided um, to club together and perhaps buy a small tanker load full of treated sewage from the local sewage treatment works, which was spread over gardens and allotments in the late winter, early spring. Come the summer, every one of those allotments was covered with unexpected tomato plants. I shall leave it to your imagination to join the dots of how they actually got there. In the late 1920s, a rose bloomed in France for the very first time. She had been discovered as a chance sport from a completely yellow rose grown by a French commercial grower called Monsieur Antoine Milland. And he named the rose after his daughter, Mademoiselle Milland, and thus it was cultivated and popularised throughout France and earned Monsieur Meillon a great deal of money. It was free flowering, highly scented and resistant to black spot. <coughs> Monsieur Meillon, like many other French growers, had to plough his crop, his life's work, into the ground when the Germans occupied France. 
but managed to secrete two bushes of Mademoiselle Melonde into an aeroplane. The last aeroplane that would take off from Paris or the airport before the Germans closed the international borders. It flew as part of the diplomatic luggage and the roads crossed the Atlantic to the United States where it was received by the American Rose Growers Association who propagated the plant and trialled it for use in America and it was found to be just as hardy, just as frost resistant, just as free flowering in the wide range of climatic zones in the free world. In 1946, to mark the end of hostilities, um, on the day that Berlin fell, coincidentally, Mademoiselle Mélande was given a new name and she was called Peace. And she stands in tribute still. If you walk down any suburban road and look into the gardens, you will invariably find that Peace is still blooming in one of those gardens. If you go looking for Peace in your rose catalogues, you will unfortunately no longer find her there because of our friends across the seas in Belgium. Um, plants offered for commercial sale have to be done so with the first name with which they were legitimately registered. So according to the law of horticultural priority, peace has had to revert officially to being called Mademoiselle Mélande. But many rose growers, and certainly you and I, will continue to think of this flower as the peace rose for many years to come, which is, I think, appropriate and right, because her blooms stand in tribute to those men who went away across the seas to defend our land from invasion, and also a tribute to those people who looked after those gardens until such time as the boys returned. So as Winston Churchill never said, keep calm and carry on. Remember, we shall fight them on the allotments, in the gardens and in the window boxes. Be careful in the blackout. And remember, above all, Go home and dig for victory.